Um, I'm going to be speaking about empowering the next generation of open source developers today. It's a BAF session, so you're welcome to participate, ask questions. It's um, intended to be a, um, more of a conversation and discussion. Uh, my name is Shua Khan. I am a Kernel Maintainer and Linux Fellow at the Linux Foundation. And one of the things I do at the Linux Foundation is overseeing uh, the mentorship program. So let's talk about um, open source um, for a little bit. It's no secret that open source runs the world, right? I mean, we all know your phones run it, technology, media, financial, healthcare, telecommunications, agricultural, travel. We can't do anything without really open source. Um, and you, you can just name everything. So AI is emerging also, so we'll be seeing more of that. So let's see, who does this open source? I mean, without people, there is nothing that happens. So who is who in open source communities? Um, as we all know, code doesn't write itself. Um, maybe not yet anyway. So AI might come along and write code, but we're not there yet. So you will see um, various players in any open source community, maintainers, developers, legal experts, community builders, educators, and more importantly, all the users. Let's talk a little bit about, we understand open source pretty much runs everything. So we know it's vital for our existence. And we know people make up of open source, maintainers, developers, and all of them, all of the people that keep the open source communities going. So now let's look at what are the markers of healthy open source communities. So they are, they have to be sustainable. A open source, healthy open source community is sustainable community. That means that we have not only uh, active participation, that we have a continued active participation um, with the people that are participating already. They are continuing to participate, the experts. And then we have new uh, developers coming into the process and learning from experts and continuing the maintenance development activities that are necessary for the project to go. And another hallmark of healthy communities is being diverse, diversity of thought. Um, not necessarily, I'm not talking about diversity in a sense of diverse backgrounds that is that is included in this when I say diversity of thought comes in with people from diverse backgrounds. So that is a, these are the markers of healthy communities in my opinion. And so we are, open source is, um, open source communities are remote communities, meaning people from various parts of the world participate in the community. So we are truly brings the planet together. We have people from different geographical locations and different languages and ethnicities participating in the community and gender. We have a open source community participation tends to be diverse. So let's look at what is diversity. Um, so diversity in, and inclusivity means that Everybody, all the participants have a seat at the table. And at just having a seat is not enough. Having a voice at the table, that means they feel like they can voice their opinion, they can participate in the conversation, they can, and they, their participation is received well. And third, that's where the voice is being heard comes in. They have to, others at the table, listen to different viewpoints and then respect to different viewpoints. And everybody at the table feels like they have a seat, they have a voice, and they're being heard. Let's look a little bit about, we talked about markers of healthy communities, and now we are talking about what are the behaviors. Welcoming to new developers. Um, being inclusive, we have done lots of inclusive language initiatives in the, in the last couple, three years. And we have a code of conduct, various uh, 
projects adopted of code of conduct uh, being inclusive and also adaptable and flexible. This is one thing that we don't think about. We, as communities, Linux kernel, for example, where I belong, we have a way of doing things. We receive patches on mailing lists and we take uh, patches from the mailing list. We hold all of the discussions on mailing lists. So this is where we, as a community, we do listen to new people coming in and saying, you know what, email-based communication and taking patches development process, it probably works for you, but maybe we should look into new ways of doing things. For example, bug reporting. We have various ways of reporting bugs. And so we are flexible. We, we at least listen to people and say new ideas coming in and say, when the new uh, developers come in and say, man, I, I can't keep up with this email. At least we listen to the new ideas. And being able to li uh, refine and evolve tools, which is important. Because when you're bringing new generation of developers coming in, um, they, view things a little bit differently. For me, I'm a command line person, but maybe the new generation comes in and says, I like that GUI dashboard, looking at um, bugs being reported, quality reports, or how many bills are happening. So we have to be flexible. We have to be flexible and open to feedback so that we can, um, we feel like again, voice at, voice at the seat at the table, voice at the table being heard. So we have to, um, listen to all the other ideas. And another important aspect is mentoring. Because we have all the experts, we have been doing things for a while, new developers come in, are they lost? Do they feel like they don't know where to start? Do they feel like uh, this is overwhelming? So we have to be, um, part of that we have to be uh, mentoring as well. So communities do this now. Uh, mentoring is a part of development process, meaning when a new patch comes in, maintainers look at it, developers look at it, they give feedback and say, hey, this is not, this can be improved or this can be refined. And all of that happens as a part of the development process. And then we engage developers, co communities engage on several ways, chat channels, IRCs, and other forums. And forums like this as well. When uh, new developers come into uh, the conferences like this, you probably noticed ask expert panels or speed mentoring. We engage them in different ways. But this is all happening as part of the development process. So let's look at whether these are effective. They are. They are within the context of developing development. These are all passive measure measures if you look at them as a whole because we're not doing anything extra. We are doing, this is all part of our development process, and we are saying, okay, when we have come in a patch, we, we, have a, um, we have a vested interest in making sure the patch is good, and it comes in, and whoever sent the patch is making changes the way we want it to make change. All of this fits into our uh, development process itself. This is, these are all, all of these passive measures are good for developers that are already engaged that already know how to contact us, already know where to reach us. They are not effective as a wider reach out for people that do not know where to come and see us. So let's look at, I call this my learning pyramid, like the food pyramid. So let's look at um, what is effective. So the bottom, in my opinion, is, the, is a um, foundation layer with learning resources. We have to provide training courses, webinars, blogs, expert blogs, explaining, saying, how does uh, Linux tracing work, memory management system works, and so on, and various other things. That forms the base. And then the second layer is mentorship programs, where we uh, design mentorship pro programs where it can work for people at large, meaning people that are maybe working full time um, and do want to make a career change. They need a part time pro participation or a flexible participation that works for them. So the part time you are seeing on there 
um, on the slide is for that. And full-time mentorship programs say students, um, summer, they're free, they have a lot of time to spend, they can participate in, on a full-time basis in any project that they want to learn, open source project. And it has to be open for all, not just saying, I'm only taking students, or I'm only taking this, um, this group of people. So open for all meaning anybody that wants to learn, wants to advance, advance or learn a different area, uh, they should be able to participate. And programs can be paid or credit only, because paying, uh, paying for mentorship is great, right? Because we are, usually you don't get education for free. But whereas you're getting education and you're also getting compensated for learning. So that's a great incentive. However, it doesn't work for everybody. Some people, especially when they are working for a company and they want to take mentorship um, with their free time, in some cases they cannot get paid. So you have to have flexible programs where credit only programs. And having these programs on a continual basis in a spring, summer, fall, um, year after year helps people plan and take, uh, plan as a whole and see what they want to do. Maybe spring is busy, so they want to do it in summer. Or maybe their final fall students, if you're talking about students, maybe the final semester of their right before graduation, they don't have a whole lot of course load. They might be able to, uh, to spend a lot of time learning so that when they go off to do something else, they will have that on their uh, resume. The top pyramid is, top of the pyramid is um, connecting. Mentorship showcases where the graduates can showcase their work and access to experts at the events, which we do, you probably saw Ask an Expert events or ask, uh, panels this afternoon. There are several experts sitting there talking to people that are coming in and asking questions. And diversity scholarships to events. So some, of the, some people that have come to this conference today, they, this, attending this conference, have uh, been offered diversity scholarships. That's how they were able to come to, and attend, this, um, attend these, uh, this conference and connect with the community and understand what's happening in the community. So this is kind of my, the way I say, my pyramid, learning pyramid. All of these components need to be in place for programs to be um, effective. We have a lot of different programs happening. Not that every single uh, company or every single entity that is providing these services have to provide all of them, but they have to keep in mind that this is this kind of structure of making resources available and initially for self-learning and then coming in and saying we have these mentorship programs that you can come and participate, learn a particular technology area and then um, having that third layer of making sure that once they graduate, they have connections. Mentors and maintainers, developers hold up that pyramid, really, providing all of these. Who is generating all these, all these learning resources, training courses, webinars, blogs? You have to have that, um, that bottom layer solid to be able to, and have interest in, in their busy maintainer lives. It's it's important to make the time, and that's where the scarcity comes in. We're all busy. So it is very difficult to not only maintain the software you are maintaining and adding new features to it, and then also make time to mentor. So you can see how it's all is based on that layer where maintainers and mentors don't always have the time to do it. So, so action plan, let's talk a little bit about action plan. How do we solve this problem, right? So equity is, we talked about diversity, healthy communities and equity. Not everybody, 
having access to resources is a barrier for a lot of people. So we have to design, when we design these programs, that in mind. Empowering learning is where all these pyramid part comes in, where you have part-time mentorship programs, webinars, training resources available. They enable uh, people, I think, that I would say parents really, that or parents and other uh, pe people that have to balance their work life. Maybe you're taking care of a elderly parent. You don't have as much time. So how do you go and enhance your learning so that you want to advance your career. So you have to, you have to keep pe that in mind that people do not have a lot of time. Um, and they have to, they are balancing a lot of things, their full-time jobs or their, their uh, caregiving. And so we have to make it easy for uh, them to overcome these barriers. So making it happen, we talked about this and uh, talked about part-time and paid mentorship programs that um, they, having all of these programs helps people um, to, to, gives them opportunities where they can fit learning into their uh, life schedule. We have the interactive webinars um, we have, um, you can learn from an expert any area and they will, it's not just slide set showing, but there will be a lot of Q&A time. And then I'm going to, uh, there are a lot of opportunities on LF training, lift scholarships that bring people in here and then also planning your paths on LF training. So this is kind of what we're doing at LF, too, with the, in this, under this mentorship umbrella, um, looking at holistically, looking at um, what kind of training opportunities people have. Um, meaning this, these training opportunities are not, um, they don't cost much, like a lot of free courses for beginners to have them learn. And then learning from experts and the training programs and scholarships that bring people into these events to for awareness. And let's see, oh yes, we talked about that. So you can take a look at this. I'm gonna leave you with this um, um, link to check out everything that's happening at LF in terms of um, opportunities available. There are a lot of other mentorship programs also. Google does Google Summer of Code. And then uh, we have Outreachy that does um, some mentorship programs. So a lot, we have a lot of people working to solve the problem. So every single program like this helps change lives. So in addition to what we are doing at LF, there are, we have a lot of other people that are also doing um, helping with the problem of uh, bringing and empowering new developers, showing them where to go, where to find resources, how to engage with the community and learn. So a little bit about, a little bit more about what resources are available at LF. This is the question I keep getting asked always. I get several emails at least um, a week asking, how do we, how can we start learning? Um, or how, how can we start contributing to open source? So this is kind of my answer to all the, compiling all the resources that we have at LF, and then also helping um, make, plan their paths. So you can go to LF um, uh, training, and then you can plan your learning path. Say you can ask, I want to be, you can actually go and say, I want to be a Linux kernel developer. Then technology, based on the technology, it will show you a path of free courses that are available, webinars that are available in that area. It could be Python or it could be PyTorch. It'll tell you. So play with that resource. 
And then the other one I talked about is the interactive um, LF Live webinars, a mentorship series that we do. We have a large collection of um, webinars already out there. We've been do, uh, starting to do this in 2019. And since that time, we do about 12 a year. So you have a, a wide range of topics, um, memory management and open source itself, legal aspects of open source. And Peter here has done one for me on software engineering. And so uh, check out his talk. It's, um, and the way the experts come in and talk is they talk about the top uh, the area that they are um, experts in, and then also give opportunity about 45, 45 split. They answer lots of questions. And sometimes we have with um, some of the um, present uh, people hosting the webinars, they end up um, probably speaking more than half of the time <laughs> because lots of good questions get asked. And we have people, the other day we did, um, oh yeah, um, couple, uh, last week, um, earlier this month, we did a webinar, um, Sergio Prado delivered a webinar on debugging techniques, kernel debugging techniques. And then everybody kept saying hi in the chat, and I counted Japan saying hi from Japan, Germany, um, I think someplace in um, one of the, either Nigeria or someplace. So it's like all of the continents represented. Uh, maybe nobody from uh, Antarctica probably, you know, <laughs> but, we got a good participation. I was amazed. I was like, okay, this is awesome. And um, okay, so in the past, uh, this is our dashboard on a mentorship um, dashboard. So we, sh we, have, we have so far accepted. This is a, um, I pulled it from yesterday or day before. So we have, uh, we have gotten 10.7K applications and we have accepted. We are somewhat selective, of course. So we have accepted 611 up, um, and we have close to 500 graduates. Since we started this program, 2019-2020, uh, that's when we started all of them. And we have paid uh, 1.7 million stipends. This is all, it's a paid learning program. So um, we, we, with this platform, it just connects uh, people in the sense that even if you do not want to apply or if somebody says I just want to know what is out there what is available they can keep come and check and connect with the communities that way maybe they don't want to participate in a uh, formal mentorship program but by coming into the site and checking all these projects that are available they get an idea of what kind of communities are out there that they can participate in CNCF Kubernetes um, risk and uh, and so many others. We this um, uh, mentorship program. Once you complete that, we do a mentorship showcase once a year. All the graduates participate. We held one in January of this year for all the 2022 graduates, and then the year before we did one in 2022 January for the previous year graduates. So this is like an upside down, um, um, you know, um, if you are familiar with college recruiting, college recruiting, recruiters come in, they are really setting the schedule and they are talking to people. But this is a reverse. Mentees sh sh uh, drive this event. They share what they have done and they can also connect with the recruiters or um, potential uh, employers on Slack channels and so on. So we also publish, um, once they complete, we publish blogs and LF um, blog site and um, also other blog site. We, we publish some on uh, Newstack. You probably saw Newstack in the sponsor um, area. So they publish some of the blogs that they take from mentees. And we have recently published one, um, one mentee graduate, graduated and she shared experience of working and writing test cases for Kiwarno. So check that out. So do, if you want to know more about the philosophy of um, what goes into 
running these programs. Um, I run, I mean, I oversee the overall mentorship program. I run the Linux kernel mentorship programs at LF. So you can take a look at that, look at the blog um, that I recently wrote. Um, and I have been running these programs since last year. I wanted to scale them up because there was a lot of interest and I can't possibly pay. There is not enough. Funding is a factor that limits how many people you can train. So I have been training about 75 people each year, uh, 25 each session, spring, summer, and fall. Um, these are all credit-only program I'm currently running. So um, we're kind of taking care of these things in some ways. We're having inviting people to participate and having a voice at the table. They are able to participate. They bring new ideas, new um, thought process. I learn a lot when I uh, host, do these mentoring sessions because um, as a kernel, I have been doing this kernel development for a while, so I have my methods and my, my ways of go-to tools and such. But when you put a new, um, when you're talking to a new developer and when they are trying to solve a problem, they come up with a different way of um, doing something that I have been doing and I go, oh yeah, that's kind of cool. I, haven't, I didn't think about it because I got my cheat sheets, so I, my, my muscle memory goes somewhere, but when you bring somebody new, you learn. As a mentor, um, it's, a, it's a different kind of fulfilling experience because I end up learning um, a lot in the process of just answering questions or somebody asks me about some subsystem that I don't know much about, so I have to go look it up. So that's all good. So this is, this, this is what, what I think has to happen more um, than what we are already doing and I don't know if you were in the previous session at four o'clock about, um, is a session about hiring and training and retention. So if you haven't checked that out. So this, this is all necessary to bring um, new developers into the new communities to keep them healthy and sustainable and more importantly, empowering them uh, developers uh, new developers to be able to take charge of their um, their learning process, give them agency so that they can learn. As a new research, we we did we we also another thing I have been doing is I want to know how effective these are. So we um, I keep asking, we keep uh, doing service. So we did one research um, earlier this year, and there is the mentorship report out there. I'll share a couple of important um, th highlights from this uh, survey we did. We took 2019 through all the way through 2022, I think. So we did survey of all the graduates and we asked them, all the part actually all the participants, not just graduates, because we took everybody that applied, um, asked them about various things. And one of the things that stood out for us is employment status. They felt like after graduating, they have more doors open for them based on the experience they gained participating in open source communities, contributing to them during the mentorship process. And then also some people reported that, that their income levels have changed in terms of they were being, they, they were able to um, get more money, um, salary, and so on. So let me see. So to me, yes, these are really important, right? Getting more money, having more doors open, all of that is important. However, to me, this is what speaks to, the, to me the most. That means that we have a confidence level of mentees when they come in, they come in to the apply and start contributing versus when they graduated. So they feel more comfortable about participating in various communities. They have worked with one or two communities and they know that know they can use that experience of working with one community and take that to another community. 
they have they have uh, confidence that they will continue to um, at some if, if they might not be able to continue right after the graduation some people engage and do it but others they can come back to it so they this speaks to me seeks speaks volumes to me because very often it is it is uh, difficult to figure out where to start it is difficult to figure out if i send a fix patch in will that be accepted will my pull request be accepted um, so do i have the confidence to speak in a public forum defending my design choices so it takes a a level of um, um, guts i would say <laughs> so you have to overcome that fear that um, when i send this um, stuff out will it be will it be accepted is it good enough you have to kind of overcome that fear of being able to go out there and present your work and then if it is accepted it's a boost and then also talking um, being able to communicate uh, clearly your ideas that's also important so all of these open source skills are not uh, not easy to it's easy for uh, companies and such to teach company ways but open source is something nobody teaches how to communicate how to um, go out and figure out what the each community does in accepting patches or accepting contributions and so on so that measure speaks to me more than anything and a lot of them are planning to come continue to contribute to um, the open source afterwards. So that's, uh, okay, let me see. I think that's, so let's talk about, this is a birds of feather session. I want to hear what you think about. Okay. There? Okay, now you can hear me. Has there been any thought about um, providing sort of a base level of documentation about different products? Because sometimes going in and delving through all the code is a sort of daunting exercise for people who aren't familiar with it. Um, and the tutorials tend to get deep very quickly. Mm -hmm. So providing sort of an overview and maybe a basic, um, yeah, basic overview for people to, to learn about what even the project is as opposed to um, having them dive in and look at the code immediately mm -hmm. so um, some projects do a good better job than others documentation is not a um, glamorous work so to speak not not glamorous not, but vital right and so is testing by the way so i see i i, I look at testing dependability for the linux kernel so is testing so it's um it's it, we have some projects do a better job of uh, having that beginner content so there is a lot of content on linux if you look at the linux kernel documentation there are tons of documents but do they address the question you're asking the beginner documentation um we have been looking at that and that is on my mind when how do you uh, we're thinking about two different things. One is that we, I was in um, LFS F FM um, yesterday evening, yesterday afternoon session. They were talking about testing. So when you look at the maintainers file, I don't know how familiar you are with the uh, Linux kernel, but there is a maintainers file um, that tells you right under the top directory, right, right under, so it tells you every single subsystem and who maintain, maintain it, maintains it and who reviews it and so on. What we are thinking about doing more of is where do you, how do you test it? So there are multiple aspects. First of all, if you get over the fact that you learned enough, the subsystem enough, and you have a fix, how do you test it? What are the tests necessary? So there is a lot goes into just getting, so new developer friendly documentation that's that's what you're saying. Well, so, I mean, if you're testing it, it kind of implies that you know what it's supposed to do. Right. Right. Series of obstacles. Right. 
You probably right. know right. it's a small fix. I mean, fix, the documentation but... represents a barrier to entry. Right. Um, it is. So doing what you can, so to bring new people in, mm -hmm. this seems like it would be to a way to facilitate that. Right. And so that's just it's just a suggestion. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm totally aware of it. I'm just saying that I use that as a part of it. I ask uh, when I am. Um, I mean, I'm doing my screening. I ask them to go um, compile the documents first and then see what they can fix. In the process, they actually learn. Um, but that implies that our documentation is new developer friendly, it's not. So we have to, we have to do that. We have to, yes, that's, that's, you're right on, on that, definitely. Yeah. Okay. I was curious. Um, you mentioned earlier uh, mentorship programs and working on scaling up mentorship programs, which is something that we're also trying to do. <laughs> and um, I was wondering if you had you you're already much bigger than us. I was wondering if you had advice uh, on navigating, in particular making sure that like the mentorship relationship or like the integrity of the program is still preserved. I know money is also an issue, but mm -hmm. I'm more interested in the like, yeah, challenges of the like integrity of the, those relationships. Right. So there are multiple, um, so mul let me see if I, yes, challenges. I do have the challenges here. So I did mention money, but it's only one thing. Mm -hmm. The, the thing I really struggle with is mentors, because the same people that can mentor are also maintainers and developers, active developers and active contributors. They do not have time to mentor very often. So that's, uh, the, if you talk about this project management box of scope, um, not having mentorship, mentoring resources, and then funds, those two are really big challenges. Yeah, like the people are one of the toughest resources to, <laughs> right, exactly. to get. Yeah, they're exactly. like the golden resource. Exactly. Um, yeah, could you talk a little bit more too? I'm so curious, I'll go read more online too about your program and what I could learn from it. But um, I'm curious also to hear about like, are your mentors uh, paid for participating. It sounds like the mentees are given a stipend, but I'm wondering about the mentors. Um, and then also like what kind of training or structure you have for like the, them building those relationships. Mm. So they don't, we don't pay mentors. Mm -hmm. It's, they're all volunteers. So to answer your previous question and this question mm -hmm. together, um, with the LF Live webinar series that I'm doing, I, my motivation is twofold. One is when some mentors, they do not, cannot make time for a mentoring three months or six months of a project, then they, if they can, they can take time to put a presentation together um, the presentation itself is like two hours commit time commitment plus whatever, however long it takes for them to put the presentation together. So that way, they if they make that investment, talking about the area that they are experts in, then the, that video, we record it, and entire session, including questions and answers and everything, and all the materials is available, and we have we have them available for free. So that kind of helps me to reach out to some mentors, experts, and say, hey, can you make time for this? Mm -hmm. So which I do routinely. So that's part of solves the mentoring resource problem to some extent. Mm -hmm. And the other angle is going out to, um, and then um, I have been asking uh, mentors to also write blogs if they have, mm -hmm. if they have the opportunity to talk about a particular area and describe that. So that is another angle. And then I am now, I ask my graduates to come help me co-mentor. Mm -hmm. So they come in, um, I already lined up one for summer and I have one already co-mentoring. What they do is 
um, all of these things, they are fresh in their heads because they just graduated. They had, they figured out all of these things. So they can um, help the, men the mentees that are participating. They can mentor more effectively as well. So including, so we kind of, I can uh, help get their, them to help me. Mm -hmm. So that happens. Um, and, um, and so, so that solves some of the problems, scaling problem. It doesn't solve it full completely, but at least I know I have them. Um, and then when I have these 25 people each session I do, what I, have, I do is I encourage them to connect um, on Discord channels, whatever channel they want to connect. So I, I hold like two office hours a week, um, and then I tell them to connect, um, all of them to connect, and teach each other and right, which they right, right. do very well by the way yeah they that's connect. my experience as yeah. well with, right yeah mm -hmm. they, they they just do and then i also that also helps them it's kind of a professional network it's almost like being in a call, um, class taking a class together right so uh, so that so that's those are the things i have been doing but if you have other ideas please share them with me i'm i mean i'm open to being able to scale without taxing mm -hmm. already Build overwhelmed maintainers and mentors, maintainers, developers, and all of them. Mm -hmm. And funding is my creative solution to finding is, well, I will teach you, but I can't pay you. <laughs> so, and, and please volunteer to mentor. I can't pay you. So these are all the creative ways I'm using. But the, people are willing, I mean, there is a lot of lot of hunger for learning. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like I'm saying, I'm, I'm not paying, but 75 people just show up wanting to learn, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we face very similar challenges. <laughs> um, the last question I'll ask, and then I'm, maybe other people have questions too, is I'm um, really interested, I, I work really um, focused on representation and diversity, and I was curious if that's something that you consider at all in your like applications process, or like what, or what is the crit criteria that you use to, to accept people into your mentorship program who are participating on the mentee side of things? Mm -hmm. We, I just take anybody that applies. Mm -hmm. Anybody applies and then um, completes all the screening stuff. I mean, I take them, I take them all. So I'll tell everybody. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I don't, I don't really worry about. Um, oftentimes, I don't even look at. Um, I honestly, platform, they don't for good reasons. Um, platform doesn't show diversity, diversity information that. Um, um, mentees share because that's a pri privacy information so i don't have visibility as well unless 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 they choose to share differently by when they send an email they share something with me so um there is a privacy aspect as well um to worry about and then i don't i kind of go okay if you um complete all my um screening um things that i asked you to do if you have you meet. You have all the prerequisites, like kernel program. We need C, C to be able to function in the kernel. You have to know C and shell, right? So if you have those two, and if you do all my um, screening, and then also if you read the blog, you can my blog about behind the scenes. You get a feel for um, how I'm thinking, because what I do is I want them to be able to learn even during screening. I want to get. I want them to get something out of application process itself. So I have my task, when I do screening assignments, I make sure that they are getting a feel for the entire, um, the sub, uh, different subsystems in the Linux kernel. So that they, even if they don't, for some reason they might say, I'm withdrawing for whatever reasons, or they don't make the cut. Or they go, no, I have a paid in, uh, something, a paid opportunity somewhere else. I can't uh, participate unpaid. So whatever reason they don't, even if the, even they make a choice to not participate, they still would have learned something that they can pick that up and then make progress. So that's kind of what it is. That's great. Yeah, we think we think about the same thing. So that's really it's really cool to hear. Thank you. I think that's it, if there are no questions. Thank you.